This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean and by Ting. Go to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device or your first month of service. Welcome to Linux Action Show, episode 325. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Good morning to you, Matt. Good morning. Are you ready for me to tell folks about the big show today? Big time. All right, well, coming up on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, finally, finally, we'll show you how to safely replace TrueCrypt with utilities built into Linux that you can trust, wrapped around some easy-to-use utilities with some nice, powerful features. So that'll be coming up in the second half of the show today. Plus, in the news segment, we're going to show you what's coming up next with Fedora, and it's kind of big. Plus, there's some gaming news. A huge city is saving money by switching to Linux, and a few other stories in there as well. Plus, in the feedback segment, we got a make good, a follow-up, and a question for the audience. Audience. And then, like always, Matt, it's also our picks. Always. Big picks. Big, Big picks. picks. Big Lots time. of stuff to go. Nothing bigger than our runs Linux this week. Top of the, We just oh peaked right here. No, not really. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is peaking or if this is the collapse of humanity. And what we now find to be interesting is a sign of our eventual destruction. I, I think it's kind of like a, a, a Stockholm Syndrome of sorts. So, uh, this is... Kind of neat. <laughs> yeah, it's neat from a, it's a neat if you're not human. Uh, uh, so this fish who plays Pokemon runs Linux. Uh, that's our runs Linux this week. Uh, Catherine and Patrick are two developers from uh, Hack New York in the 2014 class, and they set up this camera uh, and a system that tracks the fish. And as the fish moves around the fish tank, he activates different areas of the Pokemon game. Unbelievable. And, and he's right now, as you can see, playing Pokemon live, <laughs> and he's streaming it. There's 5,787 other people watching this with us right now. That, that and you know, it's and then you really think about how much like see th- oh, I'm not even going to go there. Yeah, uh, it's just unbelievable. 3 million uh views, 3.1 million views, and uh, uh 45,000 people on Twitch are uh, favored and following uh, this station, this channel. Uh over 22,000 people were watching it when Business wow. uh, Insider did a write up of it just a couple of days ago. Uh, so you can see they've gone from 22,000 about three days ago, then 50,000 about a day ago. And, I mean, it's just growing like crazy. And I think the news coverage is definitely helping. There's no question. Oh, yeah. That. But I think it's compelling to actually see what you know what's, what move is the fish going to so, make. So I tried to do some digging into what software, and we're st- I'm still trying to get a straight answer at the time of uh, the recording on a Sunday. But uh, right. this uh, supposedly has got a webcam pointed at the tank, and then they have yeah. mapped out a grid in software, and they map the regions that the fish travels into regions in the software. So there's not, like, buttons in the fish tank if you're watching the uh, if you're listening to the audio version, what it is is they've sliced this fish tank up into grids. Mm-hmm. The computer mm-hmm. maps those grids to control points, and they even have like a randomized, and they move the buttons around too. They don't, they're oh, not static yeah, yeah. all the time. Uh, and so he's not making it very far so far. Not so much. And I've seen variations of that gridding technology for people that, like, let's say you're pa- uh, paralyzed and you yeah. need to use your eyes to uh, control a desktop. Similar things to that effect. So um, it reminds me of some of the technology I've seen in ZoneMinder, actually, being able to zone things out. It's pretty neat. Uh, Zardok in the uh, IRC chat room says, actually, the problem is is that the fish requested uh, Pong. So Well, there you go. I yeah. mean, clearly the fish wants to go Yeah, Pong. fish isn't too excited about Pokemon. No, is no. The problem it was, and he was definitely against Space Invaders. I, I don't know. I'm like, I'm like a little melancholy because at one point it's like, uh, I, it's weird that a fish can get have <laughs> three million views. Yeah, I was going to leave that alone. I yeah. wasn't even going to go, oh my God. Jeez, I, I, isn't that isn't that a little strange? Well, you know, I have a solution. Um, it involves fish costumes and a uh, aqua background, and uh, grids. <laughs> you know, and we'll play random games that you guys want. Nice. And the hell with the whole. Yeah. Why not? I'll, I'll, if I find out what the uh, positional tracking software is, or if anybody knows and wants to let us know, we'll try to follow up in uh, Linux Unplugged on Tuesday. There we go. And get that, that would account. be awesome, actually. Yeah. Hey Matt, uh, before we get to our picks this weekend, this is an awesome one, especially for any of you using the system day. Uh, stay tuned for this app pick. But first, I want to thank our first sponsor this week, and that is DigitalOcean. Go over to DigitalOcean.com and get this promo code. Put it in your back pocket and just hold on to it. Just get it ready, okay? It's LAS, L-A-S, August. And uh, since you're a Linux user, you're probably okay with the whole case sensitivity concept, but just keep in mind, it's LAS, August, all lowercase. So, What is DigitalOcean, my friends? Let me tell you. DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Users can create a cloud server in less than 55 seconds. And pricing plans start at only $5 a month for 512 megabytes of RAM. A 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte 
one terabyte of transfer. Think about that. That's all fixed at $5. You know exactly what you're going to get. No surprise billing like other cloud services because this is your server. You get root access to this virtual machine in the cloud. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and now a brand new one in London. Their interface is crazy simple, but yet extremely powerful. The control panel is massively intuitive, and power users can replicate that control panel in a much larger capacity using their straightforward API. And you're seeing a lot of really cool community apps come up around DigitalOcean to make that possible. I've now got three droplets. I've got a BitTorrent Sync one that's doing a whole bunch of show production stuff, and it's doing a little bit of syncing for myself for like uh, Unfilter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I've got a brand new one that I just set up that's running own Cloud 7. I, I made a nice big one that I'm going to dedicate. Did you own Cloud that nice? I figure, I think, so this is what's so neat is right now it's just for me. And the cost right. is so reasonable that, oh, yeah. like, at $5, I don't even care, right? Mm. But what's so great about that is DigitalOcean makes it really easy to step up if I ever need to. And I'm just going to oh, yeah. make this, like, we'll eventually move over. We'll do the scheduling through this own Cloud instance oh, nice. for all the Jupyter Broadcasting shows, file sharing, art assets, all through one droplet. The, the value is absolutely insane. And when you use the promo code last August, you're going to get that $10 credit. Then you can try out the DigitalOcean droplet for two months for absolutely free. And one of the things that's really awesome about DigitalOcean is they even allow you to go back and retroactively apply the promo code if you forgot when you were signing up. You know, and speaking about the uh, the cost and one thing, so I finally burned through my credit. It took a while, but I finally got there. And one thing I found out that just blew my mind and was awesome is that I don't necessarily have to wait to be billed. I can actually prepay a few bucks right. here and there. When I, like, it's like, oh, I got a little excess cash yeah. on the old PayPal. Yeah. I'll throw a few in there. I don't. Then I just, right. it just, oh, it's You can awesome. just recharge it if you want. Right. And then when you have a few bucks in the PayPal, oh, you can set it up. That's you can charge me. it, and then you can let it go for a couple yep, of months. That's and it. when it's $5 a month, it doesn't take a lot of extra no, scratch to make that happen. It really doesn't. And I, it's nice. Like, you have a, you know, you have a really good month. You can throw a buttload of money on there if you want and then just not worry about it for a while. It's great. And they make the one-click application deployment so awesome. And DigitalOcean, to give you a little, you know, this is what I love about the companies. They've already figured it out. They've already figured out the way to deploy applications on a Linux box is Docker, right? Oh, so yeah. they've made that possible already. They're using Doku, and it's really awesome to see how DigitalOcean has seen some of the best technologies that are available for Linux and then made this into a product and put the price point at that you can go out there and create your own server that can be, uh, even if it's just for learning, the value is so straightforward. It's so clear. And then as you step it up, if you decide to make it a back-end infrastructure device, if you decide to make an important part of your services, it's easy to just upgrade to the next level. You can take snapshots and backups if you have something mission critical on there. DigitalOcean really has a great setup. DigitalOcean.com. And a really big thank you to DigitalOcean. Don't forget to use that promo code last August. That way you get the $10 credit. And we get credit for sending you to DigitalOcean.com. Yeesh. Okay, Matt, we're going to show a uh, sermon. The uh, dialogue-based system D service management utility that came from Obankio in the uh, subreddit. He pointed it out to us, and uh, it's it's for system D users. Okay, I've shown sure. a K system D before, which let you manage system D services in KDE. Hey, which is great for you. Yeah. I was going to say I'm not a KDE no. guy, so it'd be nice no. to see something else. Not a KDE guy myself, no. Matt. Nope. So check it out. Here's sermon. The command is sermon two, and uh, you can see here what you get is an end curses interface to all of the active and inactive systemd services. Ah, so you yes. can see they have little icon statuses that give you, uh, over here you have green circle for active, little triangles mean they're different boot state. You can go in here and restart services, check the status oh, of services, disable services. So say like I didn't need uh, my Bluetooth service at boot, I could, go, I could use this in here to disable that so it wouldn't happen anymore. It's a really, really straightforward way to just easily make things start and stop. And one of the things people have complained about systemd is it's too hard. Well, I mean, this makes it crazy easy. So again, it's called Sermon. It's an end curses based tool, so you can load it on your server or your desktop. And it's Serm the command line, at least on my installation, mm -hmm. is Sermon 2. Sermon 2. To actually okay. run it. Well, and what I like about it is like, so here's the twist about systemd. It's not that it's hard to use. What's hard is to remember this big string of characters as to what the hell your service is called. Yeah. That's been my big complaint. There's that problem, too. Yeah, that, That's always been my issue. I don't, you know, start, restart, stop, or, you know, uh, enable, here's, disable, think, whatever. But, see, is it you know. user share systemd Check that out. User shares, no, it's user shares. Oh, where you just get system. your list of services, yeah. Yeah, there is a directory that has them all in there. And, and that's usually what I end up right doing. Now. I always actually I have like a terminal set up just for that because yeah. I always forget. <laughs> it's but like, you know. Sermon 2, right, makes it so oh, crazy yeah. easy. Because just, it does it for me. Yeah, you just you just go right in there. And I, well, the other thing I like too is 
uh, now that like the other this kind of to your point is right now I know okay my service is called this and I could just from the command line system CTL that bad boy and it's also nice to have a screenshot or like just a, a glance over of exactly what's running um, yeah what's enabled but maybe not started and it's a nice um, that's u- another big it's one. a nice use of little color icons in the end curses terminal Definitely. like I mean because a lot of times in these types of things they don't use icon 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 anagraphy how do you say that I iconic iconic whatever it is it's iconic they don't I use icons yeah. in and then curses a lot of times it's all text right and so this right. is just makes it crazy nice well it's yeah and that's nice for the eyeballs and i think i like the states too to where you have black triangle green triangle and i'm assuming that yeah green triangle means it's that on. It's, a, it's on it's enabled yeah. but it or and be, like triangles different triangles right. mean the different like boot states and things like yeah. that. yeah okay so anyways cool. it's called sermon 2 and that's the first epic so that's first that's epic number like one that. i decided since uh i don't know i, I was feeling nice <laughs> i don't know why matt you, I you felt were just like feeling I, I wanted to do another epic so uh, the second app pick this week is a game called Skyward Collapse. Wow. It's come out for Linux just a little bit ago, and uh, it has a really neat premise. And here, mm. here's what it is. is you kind of play like, a, I guess, a, almost like a benevolent dictator god type. Okay. And uh, the point is, is you need to keep two factions on this piece of land essentially balanced out enough that one doesn't decimate the other. So the idea is you have a red faction and a blue faction here on this piece of oh. land. So we start with the red one, and you got to build them up a little bit. So let's say, like, I need a barracks, right? So there's you see there's a grid in which I can place my barracks. I can't go outside this this red grid here, for example. Okay, and that's your barracks area. Right, I build okay. these guys up. and I So, like, for, for example, I could make these guys maybe uh, really elemental. And then these guys over here, maybe I build them up and I make them, like, really, like, uh, educational or, like, they, they, they mine or something Atlantis-like like that. Atlantis-like or something, I yeah. give these guys reasons to kind of have to cooperate together. And if I don't, they'll de- one will decimate the other. And if one decimates the other, you're done. So, so the idea is to just stretch the, the brutality out as long as possible. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just saying, because if I'm playing this, I'm going to do what I used to do with SimWorld. I'm sorry. I'm going I'm to be like, you know, our... I smash, you know, or I'm going to, like, try and get them to war with each other. I, I'm just, I'm a terrible, terrible human being. I'm sorry. And there's, like, uh, you know, like, there's there's resource management you have to do, like, okay, so here I'm placing a pig farm, and now that I placed a pig farm, it'd probably be a good idea to... Uh, to also place a butcher, so that way the butcher can take care of the pigs. And oh, yeah. now that I have pigs and a butcher, I need something to make the knives with, so I might as well get an iron uh, mill going. So then I, you know, so you can see how you kind of mm. you you plant these things in, and then you build them up. And there's a whole range of choices. So depending on how you stack one side, it uh, and it's turn based, so you get everything all arranged, and then you end your turn, which I can't do yet because I'm in tutorial mode. Okay. And then the next guy goes. So what's cool about it is you get to play both sides too. So it's uh. not just you're waiting for the AIs to come get you. The fighting is done with the AI. Okay, but, but, but so you like, arrange so like it player all. one could be red, player two could be blue. Well, no, it's you. Both players. Oh, you, are here. you literally are managing what I'm both is teams. The I fighting see. is done by the computer, but I you see. stack the deck for both sides, right? So you 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 equip them both. You give like I made one guy like you know have a lot of military power, but the other guys have a lot of spiritual power. That way, they kind of needed each right. other. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. It's fun. So it's called uh, it's called Skyward Collapse, and it's like um, let me see. Oh, I, uh, see if I have mm. a store link here. It's not. It was like five bucks. It was oh yeah, a, for five bucks. It, it was a pretty like a good, good deal. Yeah, it was. A, it was not. It was not too shabby at all. Hmm. Um, let's see. Jeez. Let's see. Store page. Here we go. It would be. Oh, it doesn't tell you once you bought it. Oh yeah, there it is. Four ninety nine. Yeah, so bad. it's five bucks. Five bucks, and uh, you get to play it. And they added uh, Linux support uh, on the eleventh. So. Uh, Very interesting. Yeah, it's definitely tomorrow. very cost According to effect. this, according um, to this, they added. Uh, according to this, they added Linux support tomorrow. <laughs> oh, hey, you're, you know, time traveling. Yeah. You're time traveling. Literally so there says you go. that. Go get a game from the future. It's the future. Uh, it's a new version that's coming out tomorrow. Is what it is. So they're going to raise the IC. <laughs> so they're raising the price in ten days. So the price is going to go up a couple bucks in ten days. So they have it at a discount right now ah. to celebrate the new release, which is coming out tomorrow. So if you buy it right now, you get a brand new version too. It's Skyward Skyward Collapse. That's, so that's cool. Sermon Two and Skyward Collapse Two app picks for you guys. Now for our spotlight this week, to give a little attention, we got to say hello to an old classic. Nopix Seven Point Four came out this week. Seven Point Four of Nopix is based on Debian Wheezy. Has newer de- desktop packages though from Jesse. It uses kernel thirteen fifteen dot six xorg seven dot seven, and of course it has all kinds of goodies in there like. Uh, Chrome 36, Ice Weasel 31, AdBlock is included, also is no script by default, LXDE's in there, all that stuff. All that stuff you like, although a little bit older on the GNOME, GNOME 384. And KD 4.8.4. Ooh. That's pretty that's pretty typical Ooh. for them though. They're they're taking more of the slow road. 
Yeah, so, yeah, that's okay. Hey, man, Nopix okay. is Nopix. The reason why it's even, I mean, this was like the distro when I was like, "Holy crap! Yeah. Look how this remember was the boot up." <laughs> well, and what I remember thinking about yeah. this is, "Oh, wow! Linux is so much more versatile and right. adaptable than Windows." This was the like I already knew how cool Linux was, but this was the this was the use case where it was like, "Hold on a second! You can take one installation and it can automatically adapt itself to the hardware of that box mm-hmm. because with a Windows box, if you changed out the hardware like that, it would blue screen on boot. Like you oh, change yeah. the boot you try you change the hardware hard drive controller and it blue screens right exactly. and here it was you're taking this linux machine and you're moving or this linux cd and you're moving it from machine to machine magic oh i used to use this for recovery i think i was that was probably back uh two point something or three point one i think it was three point one i was using it for recovery back in uh, repair days and it was it was great because i'd show this to clients and they'd be like how are you doing that magic That's sauce crazy. is what you'd say it's like oh you'll get my bill don't worry about magic it. sauce you'll get my bill <laughs> you'll get my bill it's yeah. fine yeah, just check the line it. item for magic just check that <laughs> just go look at that okay hey uh, i want to make a pick uh, for those of uh, our uh, listeners and uh, viewers out there that have some accessibility needs it's called talking arch oh nice we talk a lot about arch um, and the th- one thing you could definitely say about Arch is that uh, without an installer and a proper like GUI and things like that, it's not very accessible for those exactly. that are visually impaired. So here's Talking Arch. It's a respin of the Arch uh, live image. It modif- it's modified to include speech and Braille output for blind and visually impaired users. And, of course, uh, you get all the goodies of Arch. Uh, but made possible for, for visually impaired uh, users that you can use this without needing to have any sight. And it's uh, maintained by one of the lead uh, Arch developers. He blogs about it on wow. the uh, Arch Planet. And I caught I caught a recent update. It's called Talking Arch, and you can find it at TalkingArch. Uh, sorry, TK. TalkingArch.tk. And it has some of the same functionality as uh, Adrian, I believe, right? As far as like the uh, uh, Braille machine c- uh, compatibility, yeah. things like that. And what's neat is it also includes uh, a series of audio tutorials. So oh, that's really helpful. Here's here's the basic installation right here. They oh, have yeah. available in Vorbis, and we're playing it right now. This is embedded on their website. My name's Kyle, and I'm one of the maintainers of the Talking Arch Live CD, which allows blind and visually impaired users to install Arch Linux eyes free onto their computers using speech or Braille. Isn't that neat? That is very cool, and I, and the music kind of helps it groove along too. I really I, like that. I think it's like uh, exceptionally awesome, and probably. Uh, I would think at least the audio portion difficult to maintain over time with a distribution that changes as much as oh Arch does. So I have a lot oh, of respect gosh, for that. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's a crazy. lot of hard work. So it's talkingarch.tk if you'd like to check that out. We'll also have a link to that in the show notes. How so cool is that? That's that. so awesome. I'm gonna check that out. Yeah, very neat, huh? All right, Matt, let's do the news. Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by Ting.com. Matt, Ting is mobile that makes sense. Ting is my mobile service provider and Matt's mobile service provider. And I got to tell you, there's never been a better time to switch to Ting because start saving money right now before the holidays get Definitely. here, right? Start getting that cash in your pocket. I did the math the other day, and at a minimum, no matter how you cut it on a busy month or on like, you know, if you average it all out, we are at least, the Fisher household is saving at least $2,000 every two years. Last, Good not Ting.com, L-A-S. Dot ting.com. That'll take $25 off your first Ting device. If you've got a Ting-compatible device, they'll give you $25 Ting credit. Now, my, why would you want to switch to Ting, my friends? I will tell you. No contract. No early termination fee. And you only pay for what you use. It's a flat $6. Then what Ting does is they take your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. Then whatever cut the man's got to take for taxes, they add that all up, and that's what you pay. So my bill, and I've got like, it's kind of ridiculous, but right now I've got three lines. And I think, I think, it's it's... Oh, still under forty dollars. Seriously, for oh my god! Three smartphones, That's three, so three cool. for a, for an Nexus Five, an HTC One, and an iPhone Five. Well, think about the entry level on a normal plan. That's one smartphone if you're lucky. I mean, like entry. Maybe. That's, that, I mean, maybe, and, and, that, right? and that's and I'm talking about like you don't use it. It sits in a drawer and you're paying your bill. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, like I mean, like that, and that's like pretty low tier. Oh my gosh! Oh my so, gosh! This is yeah. Un- this is unbelievable. Okay, this is unbelievable. See, this is Whoa. if you are really smart. If you are really smart about the way you use your data. If you if you use Wi-Fi a lot and you don't use a lot of minutes. Right. And uh, so we text over Viber. Oh, which is smart. This is three phones. Twenty four dollars. What? Oh my god. <laughs> That's crazy. Twenty. Look, that's my account right there. That's and, my and here, account. And I love the next two. Oh, hey, by the way, Chris, uh, refer refer a friend get fifty bucks. Yeah, so that's you, the neat thing about Ting yeah. too is once you become a Ting member, if you refer somebody, you get a fifty dollar credit. So you could essentially, like, if you use the viewer, could make th- right. that month free. So my last month's bill was a little bit higher because we went to Portland. Sure, of course. But this month, now that we're back to our regular routine, three phones, 
three phones, and you can see. I mean, we use a. I use a little bit of phone, but I really try not to use the phone. Right, right. Well, Rick Kai never uses the phone. Yeah. He's only on Wi-Fi all the time. And if you plug into like Google Voice or whatever, you can kind of bounce back and forth on that. That's anyway. exactly. I use Google Voice and yeah. Viber. I even make calls over Viber. There you it's go. crazy awesome. And Ting has a bunch of really great devices at different price points. They've got iPhones. They've got the Nexus Nexus Five, three hundred and fifty bucks. You get this. You own that phone, top to bottom. Then you go put it on the Ting service, and you're only paying for what you use with no contract. The Nexus Five with Ting represents what the future of mobile should be, and you can help vote with your wallet. They've also got great devices like the data-only hotspots, the Sierra 4G LTE hotspot, $74, God, and great. then it's a $6 LTE hotspot after that. I'll tell you, you know, whether you're traveling or you live in one of those areas where you've got the cable broadband provider that likes to go out every week, it's nice to have backup. Just at six dollars a month. I mean, it's it's like it's not even a question. It's a matter of you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't have this sitting in your drawer ready. And to go. if you go to last.ting.com, they'll take twenty five dollars off that Boom. price. Last.ting.com. Go check them out. They've also got the Novatel My Five Fifty Five Eighty, which has got the OLED screen. It's the tri band device. Last.ting.com will take twenty five dollars mm. off that one. Mm. And the other great thing about Ting, last but not least, is as a long time Ting customer, I really appreciate how transparent and upfront they are. So there's been some news about uh, Sprint T Mobile merger being on, then on. Mm-hmm, and how mm-hmm. that would affect Ting. If you're a Ting customer, you might wonder. So oh, they've yeah. just been immediately, they've taken to their blog every time something's come up and they're very clear about what the situation is and, you know, what if there's anything to worry about, which there's not. And they just tell you right there, which is great because Ting covers all kinds of things on their blog, so things that you would never expect a mobile carrier to cover. Last.ting.com. Go get yourself a phone from Ting and start paying for what you use and help change the mobile industry. Let's clean this thing up before they totally lock it all down. Last.ting.com. And stop throwing money in the burn bear barrel. You know? Yeah, I mean, right. really. I mean, essentially, I mean, if you're not going to do that, I mean, just go ahead and take a big bunch of cash, just put it in the barrel, light it on fire, and get it over with. I mean, really. Hey, you know us, Matt. We love ourselves a big uh, switches to Linux story. And uh, so here it is, city administrators of, I'm going to say Turin? Yeah, Turin? I, th- I believe it's Turin. I'm it's trying, the, I was looking at that earlier, and it's like, It's uh, the first Italian city to I adopt Ubuntu. Turin. Also, not just Ubuntu, but open office. Mm-hmm. Uh, the city administrators calculated that up- updating the licenses for all the PCs running Windows would cost them a whopping 22 million Whoa. euros over five years. See, this is really the long-term fallout from the yes. death of XP. Oh, yeah. At the same time, adopting Linux and open source alternatives will actually save them six million. They, <laughs> they end up six million in the black. Wow. Six wow. million in the black, despite See, all that, of the costs just... to switch over. So, of course, they decided to go with open alternatives. They specifically choose Ubuntu, uh, Apache's open office. They're going with the Apache licensed, uh, mm-hmm. the Apache Foundation. They're still open. If you didn't know, open office is yeah, still Yeah, they still thing. exist. They're still yeah, a thing. It's still a it's thing. Still yes, LibreOffice is also a thing. Uh, hmm. And uh, they're using Firefox and Thunderbird. They're going to put it on 8,300 old office computers. Interesting. That are all running XP right now, I presume. That makes sense because, I mean, you know, the hardware still works. And uh, why get caught up in license key hill, you know? I love seeing these stories. And back to a discussion we had on Linux Unplugged on Tuesday is, once again, here's another example of despite Canonical's total lack of interest in the right. desktop. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Temporary, total, absolute, yeah, yeah. incomplete lack of interest. We'll, we'll in the call desktop. it an absence. You know. uh, despite that, the momentum from having even a halfway decent replacement to XP has put them in the running for a lot of huge switches. We talked about in Linux Unplugged about the massive amount of popularity that Ubuntu right. seen in India, and I think maybe that is perhaps what the Ubuntu team sees as they look at this. I hope say, so. I, I think they're kind of so, like, and yeah, you know we what? can try harder, but you know, we're, we're good. We I, got- they, didn't, they didn't say in this article, but I bet it's 1204. Or maybe oh, it could yeah. be 1404. It could be 1404. I bet these guys don't even care. Like, I bet uh-huh. they, they they don't even, they look at 1404 and they're like, ah, that's too new. Who cares? Yeah. Like, these the people that are making the switch don't give a crap. No, they really don't. No. I mean, and they, you know, they're like, hey, look, what's stable? I mean, we, we right. don't need bleeding edge. We're right. good. We're happy. Yep. All right. This is the story that everybody Everybody's Everybody. talking about this weekend is blowing up on every website that talks about Linux stuff. It is now officially possible as of episode 325, Sunday, August 10th, 2014, possible to play Netflix natively under Linux oh with my. no plugins. OMG. I mean, it's just, it's about friggin' time. <laughs> now, myself, I've never watched, I've, I got watched Netflix on a computer once. I just never really got into it, but I, because I do it on you know, little set top boxes, but I think it's cool that I have the option option of doing so if I'm in my office and I'm thinking, oh now, my God, I don't want to do this, I could watch this instead. Matt, to celebrate yes. here at the Linux Action Show, uh, we've actually set up the 
HTML5 camera <laughs> right there. So you can see we're now rocking the Bonobo. Nice. I've adorned the HTML5 uh, official logo. Now, uh, this is possible thanks to them adopting DRM support in HTML5 for all you HTML5 lovers out there. So we are now officially rocking HTML. We'll, st we'll check in with the sticker from time to time. There it is. So there's a few caveats to make this work under Linux. You ready for the... Butts. There, there's some butts, but they're not horrible. not unmanageable. You got to no. have the current dev build of Chrome as of this recording. It's it's version 38. So are we talking like a beta repo? Yeah, yeah, big time. Beta re okay. Not even like beta, but like like the one step beyond that. Dev oh, build. the least, uh, the unstable or whatever yeah. you call it. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, yeah, so you get that, and then the other caveat is you have to get, and this is all linked in the show notes, mm -hmm. uh, a user agent switching extension. And there's to, only like 50 of those, so yeah. Right, but we got a good one linked in the show notes. Yeah. Um, in fact, if I go down, one of our audience members was really awesome about, uh, uh, he hooked us all up in the subreddit with all oh, the info. So okay. there's a thread about that, but I've linked directly to the user agent switcher. Then you have to go paste a user agent string into the switcher program. Yeah, of course. Then you set that user agent switcher program to automatically engage whenever you go to Netflix.com. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay, so you got three steps. You got to get the uh, version 38 of Chrome mm -hmm. somehow. You have to get this user agent switch switcher, and you have to put the right user agent string in there. That's a simple copy and paste. Then you have to turn it on when you're on Netflix. Here's the rub for Arch users who have discovered, yeah, Chrome, not so much. Um, at least as far as you want to install it. Last time I tried to install Chrome, that wasn't going to happen. So You got to get the right one. So, you got, so what about like Chromium? Chromium is a no-go? Um, I wonder because I mean because I, I don't know because last time I tried Chrome and Arch that it, it something in uh, Chrome blew itself up. And so wasn't I went happen. Chrome because I have Chromium for my I have so you got Chromium, it working again. Chromium stable for my main browser okay. and then I have I installed Chrome unstable from the Arch user repo. So here it is so you did okay. Here's cool. this is Netflix. You can see up in the corner I have the uh, extension uh, right now. So right. I have it. Oh, set. that's the one I use. Yeah. Yeah, it, it works, right? It's real it's nice. A, it's easy. one of the better ones because it not only works reliably, but it's actually fairly straightforward to paste stuff in and get done. So uh, well, I could pick, I, I should be able to pick any of these. We'll do Clone Wars yeah, here, yeah. for example. So you can see it starts up. Oh my God, how much faster that is than uh, the Wine. And, oh, and, and when you can you right click? No, no right click. But that's okay. On the old one in Wine, if you right click, it does horrible, horrible things. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, it I, that's because it's probably using Silverlight. Yeah, it was yeah, yeah. using a Silverlight wrapper, and it was just all messy. Yeah, so we could, uh, so we should be able, yeah, anything in here. Wow. So Ooh, here's hey. Voyager. He's gone. He's gone. He's directing us to a system 2.3 light years from here. And you can see how, I mean, it's, it, it is literally, it is trouble free. Wow. Right? Wow. I mean, uh, that's actually going to happen when I get home. Yeah. I, it's so. Uh, <laughs> Ooh. Stop asking questions, old man, and we'll slip you an extra five grand that your crew doesn't need to know about. <laughs> I love Futurama. God, I love that show. So there, there it is. Linux, no plugins, That's natively so working in awesome. Chrome. Uh, you can all thank uh, HTML5 getting support for DRM for it. I hope you're happy. Now you can all go watch your commercial content. That's right. And then all the, uh, you know, the free software advocates that are frothing at the mouth right now. Um, you know, sorry guys, but we like our TV. I don't tell you so. Yeah. It was either that or piracy in jail time. So, I mean, you know, we're going to kind of probably go with the Netflix. So, no more uh, no more fake and silver light if you're nope. a Netflix user. That's nope. nice. That's good. I'm okay with that. I don't know. I'm just... So, at first, by the way, first broke uh, on uh, by uh, Nathan Van Camp on uh, Google+. Plus. He has the steps up there. We also Very have a link cool. there. This is the user agent string. You just copy and paste that yep. and put that in there. Right there. That's and, it. Uh, and it's really simple. I mean... It works as long... The, the key is you got to get that right version of Chrome. That's yep. really the... That's the big thing. See and here I'll pull it up on the screen. So, so, that so like Ubuntu users, I would if I'm not mistaken, um, you have stable, uh, unstable testing or testing unstable. I don't remember which is what, but just keep playing around until you get to that uh, number right there. So version. for those of you who are having problems with this, I'm using yeah. version 38 of Chrome, 64 bit. Yep. yep. Uh, which is pretty awesome that the 64 bit version worked too. That's it. Hey Matt. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but the Flock conference, the Fedora, the Fedora contributor conference, ran from August. It runs from August sixth to the ninth. So oh, right on. I guess it just wrapped up. Okay. Cool. Just wrapped up, or it's right? Is this August? I, now? Uh, I can't even tell you. Yeah, it's August now. Yeah. Yeah, it is August, and it just wrapped up. In fact, it, I know it just wrapped up because we've got some stories from it. Some interesting things are afoot with uh, huh? Fedora. Why don't we start with uh, the state of copper? Because we've talked about copper cool. on the show a few times. Uh, so uh, Miss Golfy. Suchi delivered a report on the state of copper yesterday, and uh, he demonstrated how far the service has gotten in one year. If you're not familiar, copper is a lightweight build service for contributor packages that aren't yet in Fedora officially. It started less than a year ago, but the service is already hosting more than 250 gigabytes. Nice. It's, it's churned out more than 225,000 builds, actually. 
So in a nutshell, it's a system for building packages and offering up, offering up repos that aren't yet available for Fedora. For example, GNOME 3.12 was uh, oh. built for Fedora 20 using copper. Before work on copper started, this is something I wondered, they did look at the OpenSUSE open build service. Interesting. They said it was more complicated than they wanted, and OBS used different scripts to build packages, and there was concern that copper and Koji might produce different builds of the same packages. However, they said there's a possibility that copper might use the open build service in the future, but for the time being, it'll remain its own product. Very cool. Uh, so Copper's made some great strides. They're not done yet. They've had, they've had, uh, they haven't had any legal issues like they were worried about. Good. Uh, Good. Uh, they, ha- they have had uh, some infrastructure problems. They're investing in that right now. And also, one of the big things they'll be adding, which is kind of, in my opinion, mandatory, really, mm-hmm. is package signing. Oh yeah, yeah. That's I mean, currently oh, missing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's an important that's an important thing. And now that Copper is growing, they recognize that. Also, ARM builds will mm-hmm. be coming to Copper mm-hmm. soon for folks who use Fedora on ARM machines. Well, talking about package signing, and I'm really not that familiar with exactly how the whole back end of the PPA system works. But I'm not mistaken. I don't believe there is for PPAs. I is think that, they're self signed. Are they self signed? Which yeah. essentially you means have to nothing. import that Jipichiki, and then uh, you just have to trust them at that point. So the yeah, only thing so, that really tells you if it ever changes. Yeah, which is meaningless. So yeah, yeah. it's not no, because so, if you yeah. if they uh, yeah because if they change it, then you'll get an alert. But if they're bogus to begin with, then you've just accepted. Because essentially, bogus key. it's like, hi, I'm I'm a creepy hacker guy that wants to own your computer. Don't worry, you'll get the you'll you'll know that if I updated anything. So we're cool there. But I'm going to own your stuff. Whereas copper, it sounds like there's something a little more official as far as the signing's going on. That's a little more uh, maintained and uh, you know. We got another pickup cool. from Guadic. Uh, status of uh, Wayland and Gnome coming out of Guadic. Uh, mm. Jasper Saint Pierre presented overview of Gnome's Wayland support on July 28th. And I'd missed this, so I wanted to pick up because uh, Linux at LWN.net uh, grabbed it. So a lot of are familiar, a lot of you guys are probably familiar with one of the problems, one of the reasons we want to replace X11 is the atrocious security situation uh. that X has. So St. Pierre, uh, he actually illustrated one of these problems by doing a little demo. He wrote an exploit that showed off X11's lack of application isolation by, among other things, logging keystrokes and drawing into another application's window. These insecurities at the heart of GNOME's interest in switching to Wayland, he said. His keylogger could record passwords typed even when the GNOME screen lock was active. So oh, he kind wow. of that's how he started the talk. Uh, he talks a little bit about the driver situation in Wayland because one of the things we've been wondering about is like, hey, like when we go to run Wayland, what's our driver support going to be like? Right. As you probably expected, Intel are, has the most complete Wayland support. The open source drivers for NVIDIA are the next best, uh, while the closed source NVIDIA drivers don't work at all with Wayland. Whoa. The reason for that is NVIDIA doesn't offer all of the functions the open source drivers require for Wayland. Uh, the NVIDIA binary XORG driver is tied directly into X, so the company can implement Wayland support for them eventually, but nothing yet. Yeah, and I could see pretty much everyone kind of dragging yeah. their feet on We've that one. We've talked about that before. Yeah, and then boy. it gets into supporting mm. Mirror, too. Uh, so in response to an audience question, uh, St. Pierre further explained that supporting new GPUs, generally speaking, is not only harder or, sorry, is not any harder under Wayland than it would be under X. Supporting new GPUs on Linux essentially boils down to supporting mode setting and supporting direct rendering. Wayland support hinges on direct rendering. But most of the work required for a new GPU is the same for Wayland as it would be for X. So that's good news. Right. Uh, There's also ongoing work to talk about how to best take screenshots of the whole desktop. Not currently possible. Oh, wow. Something uh, so elementary we take total granted for. They, you know, they say you look at it, 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 the problem is they're worried about people being able to take screenshots of usernames, password combinations. They say the straightforward solution is to force screenshot, screenshot capture to require a user to verify the action. If the, ver- if the user verified the action, then they would feel like maybe that'd be enough. Uh, two other questions raise more difficult application compatibility concern. One person asked how Wayland's isolation of process windows contents would affect graphics applications like GIMP or PDV, mm-hmm. which have like separate like color selector yeah. windows and stuff. Uh, they right now that's not going to work under Wayland because you can't have one window directly modify another window. They're all isolated oh in sandbox. Uh, so they're working on that. One audience member asked how to sell users on this change and the fact that GIMP doesn't work anymore, but you can drag Windows now without tearing. Is that the sales pitch? St. Pierre joked that installed, he installed Wayland and all he got was a new set of bugs, and they should make a t-shirt about that. <laughs> but the truth is, with a lot of these bugs will appear because of the switch, and the fact is it's not handled properly. The real risk is that more noticeable outcome will be people getting unhappy about the change. Mm-hmm. So they're worried about these things, and they are work, working on them. So we go back to the old uh, issue of people will choose easy over over security. 
they we've seen it with Windows, we've seen yeah, it with everything, and so and, and P, oh Apple, I would, and I, I know that sounds stupid. I mean, I know better than I would. They won't let. I want you, dual though. monitors. Oh well, then screw that. I, I mean, you know what I mean? Like if the application is under Wayland, you won't have. They, they, I won't be using the application, but it won't be your. No, it won't be your problem to yeah. solve. It'll be the developer's yeah. problem. I mean, I, I'll tell you right now because I mean, I you know, uh, gaming and dual monitor. If you're not you're not on board with those guys, bye bye. Oh, it'll work. That'll okay. work. Okay. Uh, what's not going to work is like. Uh, some of the little weird things where, like, you have one window that pops up where it manipulates the window underneath it, like the color mm. changing stuff. That's I'll, I'll, I'll screenshots. Yeah. Well, screenshots is going to be work on it, though. Know. Here's another one that doesn't mm. work. You ready for this one? Okay. 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 Don't freak out. Okay. I'm going to hold on to my pants here. There is specifically been some talk about Wayland support in the next version of WebKit, which Gnome uses for, you know, the built in web browser. Right. A lot of people use WebKit, right? Right, right. Um, in large part, he said the WebKit GTK Plus support for Wayland relies on the same GTK backend support as other applications, but there are several factors that make WebKit unique. First, it doesn't support hardware vi accelerated video compositing at this time, which mm. WebKit needs for video playback. Now, the problem is, is how do you have a, how do you have a part of a window broken out and video accelerated through OpenGL right. and put back in the window and not make that a security? Vulnerability. Right now, oh, yeah. we have that in X because they're essentially using the lack of a security model to, right. to, to project something into another application. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can't do that in Wayland. Uh, so the same technique is not allowed because it involves handling the graphics off to a separate process, a major security risk. Instead, get ready for this. WebGTK Plus has its own nested Wayland compositor that runs inside the main UI process, making this work required writing an extension into Wayland, but only a small one. It currently works only on Intel graphics and is less well supported elsewhere because it relies on several OpenGL specific extensions. Uh, more time in the oven. Very hacky. Yeah. More time in the oven. Reminds me of, uh, oh gosh, what was it? Um, Flash Wrapper for 64 uh, bit systems. It reminds yeah. me that kind of that kind of uh, hackability. You know, yeah. Sort of, kind of. It's supposed to work, but rarely does. It's, it's um, still yeah. a little ways off before we're going to be recommending it for everybody. I have a feeling a lot of X users will be sticking to X for a while. Um, they're also right now not they don't have a great way to handle plugins for web gtk plus the opinions are even divided on this personally uh, pierre said i don't want to have to worry about plugins i don't like them says you maybe other people do uh he also says things like flash are currently not possible with a browser under wayland and right now the best bet is a reusable open source javascript clone from mozilla that could render flash in javascript which sounds like we're going to lose a lot of performance in Flash again. Yeah, it sounds like there's going to be a lot of people sticking with X. Yeah, for a, while, for a while. For a while. I mean, not saying forever, but I'm just saying, you know, again, I go back to what I said before. I, you either work or you don't. I don't care what you're I, I must is. be a masochist because I read all this and part of me is like, hmm, I kind of feel like digging out an Intel graphics only box, loading for really? 21 and going Wayland. Oh, for testing would be awesome. Uh, for production, I'd sooner play in the freeway uh no, no, no way <laughs> yeah I, I won't do that for to sure myself. yeah for testing and uh, hey by the way speaking of testing if you go grab fedora 21 i believe at least starting in the 21 release if you have uh, graphics that are capable of it this is the gdm login screen and you drop down the little configurator and you have Ooh. gnome and then you have gnome on as wayland and you'll be able to log so wayland won't be default in 21 but if you got everything to support it it'll be a drop down option and that's a good way to do it because then you get your wayland out of the box but at the same time you're not like tossed into it going oh my god why why does nothing work? You know, that kind of thing. I mean, yeah. you, you get some choices. That's cool. Yeah. I'm good for that. Stay tuned on the Fedora topic. Uh, the developers will be joining us from Fedora. Some developers from Fedora will be joining us. They're getting settled back from their Flock conference. Nice. And then we'll have them on the show soon to talk about what the heck's coming up with Fedora next because a lot of really good write-ups that producer Eric has linked in the Linux Action Show subreddit have come out from mm. Flock. Everything from how they're restructuring the update process, uh, how they're going to be working with Docker, how containers will work on the future of the Fedora desktop, all of that, they just came out from these flock sessions. We'll talk to them about some of that stuff, but if you want to read it yourself, it's all linked up in the linuxactionshow.reddit.com subreddit right now. Good stuff. Yes, it is. All right, Matt, that's all the news for this week. Have you been searching for a true crypt replacement? I know I have, and I want to know whatever I use, I want to know I can trust the technology it's based on. Well, I have found Tomb, and it relies on technology that's baked right into Linux that's industry standard stuff. Before we talk about the, that, though, I want to thank our segment sponsor, System76. Go over to System76.com, and by the way, now is a better time than ever because they got the back-to-school specials going on. I, I, 
if you don't know about System 76, first of all, what are you living in a closet? Yeah, I mean, come on. This is really what this is what all of us as desktop Linux users have wanted to see for a long time. The productization of Linux where you take a complete solution, the support, good hardware, great implementation and easy to an easy to purchase process from beginning to end. System 76 is there with great machines, with great support, a great staff, a great company and they're participating in the Linux community. They've got laptops out of the box designed to work with Linux, born to work with Linux. So that way you never have to fight with configuring hardware. You don't have to worry about when you upgrade to the next distribution if your wireless is going to still work. When I hear about people that are fighting with wireless, I just think to myself, that's last decade's problem. Right, right. Yeah, it's just kind of like, why are you running a machine that doesn't have compatible wireless? And, like, you know, you I, I, Matt, I've said it so many times, but I think the Rattel performance is one of the best machines on the oh, market. Yeah. It's quiet. You can pack a ton of performance into it. It is a rock-solid performer. And right now, with the back-to-school special, they're taking 100 bucks off. Ooh. You can get an i7 in that bad boy. You can get dedicated graphics. Or you can go with the Intel chipset if you don't need 3D gaming. Right. I think this is huge, too, because if you're not a gamer and you still want something that's going to have, oh, I don't know, Wayland support mm -hmm. or compositing mm -hmm. out of the box, this machine's going to do it for you every install. You when go. you just do the base install, this machine's going to have those features for you. Plus, it's a performer. You can put SSDs in this if you want. It's got expansion slots. You can get wireless if you need to put it somewhere you don't have an Ethernet connection. There you go. There's so much flexibility and options with the Rattel performance. And now that it's $100 off, I mean, really, this is the best time to get one. So go over to System76.com. Get yourself something nice and tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. Stop fighting with your hardware and start playing with your Linux. Nice. System76.com. Good stuff. So, uh, Matt, I felt a lot like uh, viewer of the show, Mike Doherty. He tweeted just last night, current status. Hmm. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> How do I or how do I do that LVM Lux dance again? And why isn't this easier? I just need to replace TrueCrypt. Oh, no kidding. And uh, I've got a. Let me tell you. So I'm attacking this from my need, okay. and I don't know. This may not apply to everyone. It probably won't. There's a lot of there's a lot of ways to do this under Linux, and I wanted something that will work in my use case. So I, on occasion, am sent things for our show unfiltered mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are not. Probably not a good idea to leave sitting around on an unencrypted file system. Sure. And I need something that, you know, if I'm out on the road doing these shows, if we go to OSCON, I need something that's portable that I can actually use. So I need something. One of the things, so TrueCrypt could do a lot of things. TrueCrypt could encrypt a whole partition. TrueCrypt right. could encrypt a drive. Or it could just do a file. And then you would mount that file as a drive, write to it, and then close it off. That's oh. what works for me because I like having a file on my laptop. It's not the best situation, but for me, from a practical standpoint, it's something I always have with me. I can throw it in my own cloud or Dropbox sure. or BitTorrent Sync. And it's it's essentially a volume I mount on demand. I save what I need into it, and then I close it out. I like that. I like that. You know, because then you're not you're not leaving it wide open when it doesn't need to be. Right. There's no sense in that. And and you could also do like an encrypted um, thumb drive, for example. Sure. Oh, the problem yeah. is, is maybe I forget to bring that with me, or you lose it, and then you just, lose then it. You lose all your files. It, mm. it the, or the drive wears out. That happens right. with thumb drives as well. And I need to be in a situation where I've gotten an email. I need to remove this email immediately and save it to my file system immediately. And I need that to be a protective process and I need to be able to do it wherever I'm at so that way it can be done as fast as possible. So a straightforward pipeline. So mm. this is where Tomb comes in. Tomb hmm. is the crypto undertaker, as they call themselves. Like it's 100% open source. Its whole goal is to make strong encryption super easy to use. It's like a locked folio that can be safely transported and hidden in your file system. Keys can be kept separate, too, so you could have a key on your USB stick. Oh, yeah. And there's some other solutions I'll tell you about for your keys. And it's, so it's a key and a file-based system, and I really, really like it. One of the things I like about Tomb, and I went through like a list of things I wanted to have in my encryption software. Right. All dependencies of Tomb are pretty much just common Linux components. Almost every Linux system by default has everything you require to use Tomb installed by default. If it's not, nice. I have all the files you do depend on and almost guaranteed those files are in your repo. It's things like GPG, you know, mm -hmm. like real mm -hmm. straightforward stuff. Uh, it uses DMcrypt for the block-level encryption. DMcrypt is built right into the Linux kernel. It's something I respect a lot. DMcrypt is an enabling technology. It can encrypt full devices. It can also encrypt loopback devices. It can, uh, it can, it, it is really, it's been around since about 2004, and it's really impressive. And on top of DM Encrypt, Tomb is using Lux. Lux is a disk encryption created in 2004, written specifically for Linux. Its disk encryption is implemented different 
It's not. It's not. Um, I mean, I'm sorry. It's not like a weird uh, proprietary encryption. Right. It's very standard. It's something that oh, you could use good. on any Linux box that has anything newer than the Linux 2.6 kernel. That's so pretty reasonable. So it makes reasonable. it super universal, yeah. right? So everything's built into Linux. It's using industry standard technologies. That's been in the kernel since 2.6. Portability is there. Okay. I like that. I like it. So, so far. this is why so far for me, Tomb was really awesome. And uh, I have the instructions on how you install Toom in your distro. It's very straightforward. First, grab the uh, dependencies, things like ZSH, uh, GNU PG, and a few other optional dependencies that I've included in the show notes. And then you just make install. And it, it you just download the targ, you extract the targ z, make install, it'll put it in your user local directory, really easy. Nice. If you are an Arch user, it's already in the Arch user repo, so you can just pull it down. It's Toom, T O. T O M B from the Arch user repository, so that it's really straightforward to get installed. Very cool. And do you have to also for Arch users? Do you have to pull down the dependencies as well, or is that just automatically? Uh, there is. It'll by? pull down everything you need except for one thing, and I'll okay. tell you about that in a second. Cool. Um, as we get to that, so once you have it installed, and I'm not going to walk you through the install because the install is it's, it's oh, straightforward yeah. as installing as you're building. Gets. Yeah. Yeah, it's make install if you don't have it in your repo. Once you have Tomb installed, you drop to the command line and become root. This is, if I'm going to put, by the way, I have a cons category. You got to do a lot of stuff as root. You could potentially consider that a con. But let me show you in Tomb how you create a secure Tomb. Yeah. They're, they're called Tombs. They're really just files. I, I love that. Yeah. They're loopback files, really. So I have all the commands in the show notes. You guys can follow along if you want. But you start with the, with the dig commands. You type in Tomb dig. And then you tell it, uh, here you can see my command right here, S-S dash S is the size. Okay. I'm going to make it, a, you have to, it has to be a minimum of 10 megabytes, but it could be as large as you want. You can also grow tombs, but you oh, cannot really? shrink tombs. Interesting. That's good to know. That's good to know. Uh, so then you name your you name your tomb. I'm naming mine secret.tomb. And then you see I did this dash F? Yeah. If I don't do the dash F... I, it, uh, the operation of ports here, and uh, this oh. is this is kind of neat. It shows you they're they're really looking at this stuff. What Tomb says, it comes back and says, "Sorry, bro, an active swap partition has been detected. This poses a possible security risk. What I recommend you do: turn off your swap." Oh no, kidding! Because the idea is contents of memory could be written to the swap right. file. Someone could analyze your swap file and potentially pick out something like the key or That's a password. A lot of non forensics people don't know that, right? So, but I don't care because no. this is just for demonstration right, sure. purposes. So you can do dash F. And if you don't care, you can do dash F. But it gives you the command to just turn your swap file off for a few minutes. Okay. Not and then dash F does what instead of then? It says, hey, I don't care about my swap. Force oh, that. Okay. Force the matter. Force it. So you create it right there. And uh, it says, of course, in fact, let me, uh, I already made it because I was making one earlier. Yeah. So yeah. Boom. Uh, it goes and creates it. It takes a second. The the uh, the smaller it is, the faster it goes. Okay. And you can say here it's done digging. My tomb is not ready yet. I now need to forge my key and lock my tomb. I love this. It's almost like you get to play a game while you're building your right. tomb. Right. And look, it cool. gives me the next commands I need to type word for word right here. Oh, so that's great. There's no ambiguity. I, I have them all in the show notes, right. but there's no mystery. It's right there. Now, here's the part that takes a long time. Generating the key, depending on how fast your machine, could sure. take two minutes. It could take 20 minutes. It so, you know, whether you're going really Pentium 3 or you're going i7, you yeah. know, kind of depending where Pretty you're much. at here. You know. So that's the forging process yeah. because that is, it's using entropy in your computer to generate random numbers, and it yeah. needs a certain amount of random numbers before it will proceed. So I went ahead and already created my key, so that way we weren't sitting here for right. five minutes. The Bonobo actually busted out pretty quick. But once you have your key, you create your key, you now need to lock your tomb with that key. So right now, we just have an empty tomb that's not password protected. It's not Got encrypted. It. When we go tomb lock, we tell it, you here we say, generate a key. Mm -hmm. or, or, I'm sorry, I generate a key. I'm doing dash K. This says, use the key I generated. Apply this key to the secret tomb. Okay. So I gave it the tomb name. When I hit enter, it comes up. If you're on the GTK desktop, it'll ask you for the password that you created when you made the key. So I go ahead and I put in the password. It's now formatting the device in extend or the uh, secret tomb in extended four. It's 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 encrypting it with Lux. Wow. And now my tomb is ready. My secret dot tomb is now secured with that wow. key file. Now you can only open that tomb now using that key file. So let me show you how you do that. 
And for anyone that might be confused, uh, it almost looks like GNOME keyring just kicking up its usual. You know, I want, yeah, they have. If you're not on, if you're not right. on GNOME, they'll just prompt the password to right. the command line. Okay. So now you tell Tomb open. I give it the file name of the tomb I want opened. Okay. I give it the key that I'm going to use to open the tomb. And because I have my swap file active, I'm telling it to force. There's, there's the it, commands. Right interesting there. thing I noticed here is not only are you using, um, you know, you're using open versus lock, but you're also reversing the order of yeah. the tomb and the key. Right. So. Because before you were locking the right. tomb with that key. So that's now you're opening the tomb, so I'm saying open this tomb, use this key. Right. So I hit enter, and now ask me for the password, because okay. this is what the key is encrypted with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I give it the password, super secret, super secure. It now mounts that tomb at media slash secret dot tomb. Oh, so if we nice. look at mount, I now have that tomb mounted as a drive. So oh, it's right there. Loop yeah, zero. so we could open up like, uh, here, let's go to Nautilus. Yeah. And we can go in here, and you can see right there, there's secret. Now, the problem is, is I don't have right access, because sure. we just did everything as root. Yep. So that'll be the first thing you hit when you do that. But that's super easy to fix. Just do a chown, change owner, mm -hmm. Chris F., right? And I'll go media, secret. And now I've just made that secret tomb owned by Chris, and now, now I can go in here, and I can create files uh, in uh, Nautilus in my secret tomb now that I have access to it. Yep. So uh, that is it. So there's a few problems. And now, now when I'm done with my secret, I've made my secret folder in my encrypted tomb file. This is my encrypted volume. Now I just go tomb and close. And tomb will close all mounted encrypted volumes. Oh, nice. So basically from a visual perspective and also from a security perspective, it's all it vanishes. Yeah. You, there's no trace. So you can see there it says your bones yeah. will now rest in peace. I love that. And, I uh, love that. And cool. my, my tomb is no longer mounted. There's a couple of problems I have with this. Number one, the key sitting here on the file system. So uh, we got we got to yeah. clear that up. Yeah. Number two, it's pretty obvious that secret.tomb is where all my goodies lie, right? <laughs> right? That's pretty obvious. Right, right, right. So let me show you how you if you were actually going to use this in production, here's how I would do it. Okay. Okay, this uh, is helpful. I would I would I, I would use yes, it's a little bit of security through obscurity and a little and um but again, this what I'm trying to go for here is if you really wanted security with Tomb, you'd probably store that key on like a separate USB device. Oh, absolutely. You would not keep it on the computer. Right. That, that's no. And you definitely wouldn't keep it in the cloud. No, yeah. By any yeah, stretch. Yeah, yeah don't put it in your Dropbox. Don't do that kind yeah. of stuff. Here's the thing, though, is I'm trying to strike a balance between ultimate portab portability where everything right. is on my bonobo, but yet still have a reasonable amount of security. And I think to do that, I have to A, acknowledge it's a bit of a compromise, and B, you do have to employ a little bit of misdirection. So here's what I did. <laughs> I created a Windows 7 virtual machine oh. in my slash opt. So here okay. I am. I'm in, uh, I'm in slash opt slash VMs slash Win7. Right. Okay. In here is a Win7 virtual box machine. It's actually just totally a blank VDI. Right, but total, for the purposes of demonstration, yeah, sure. I have a two gigabyte VDI. Then I have three 27 megabyte VDI images. One of these is a tomb. Oh, that's brilliant! Cause right? Because if you're if you're glancing over this in a casual, non-heavy forensic sort of way, you're not you're just going to gloss yeah. right over it. Be that's like, my okay. thinking, and I I intentionally yeah. I intentionally created a multiple disc and stashed it in there. Right. But here's another part that's super cool. If you install the pa the package stag hide s t e g hide yeah when you install uh, tomb. Tomb can actually hide the key in a JPEG file using steganography. Oh my God, that's... So you don't have to have the file sitting around the file system. It's that embedded in a JPEG. It's James Bond action. Right. So you can see here, wow. I don't have a key. So let me show you how I could extract that key and restore this virtual tomb wow. that's not actually a VDI. So I'll, I'll demonstrate that now. So uh, I've already done the uh, tomb bury command, but tomb, okay. if you have steg hide installed... Tomb has a bury command, and you say, Tomb, take the key I've generated mm -hmm. and bury it into this JPEG image. And then it buries that key into the JPEG image using steganography, and then you just delete the file. off. So you don't. So you still have the JPEG. Right. So now what I have is I have this VDI, well, it's not a VDI image, but it yeah. looks like a VDI image. And somewhere else on my file system, I have a completely innocent-looking JPEG file that only I know is actually the key to this file. And That's it's just awesome. in my pictures directory with all the hundreds of other background pictures I have. And, and make sure the pictures are just completely mundane as yeah. possible. And lots of pictures of, like, yeah, family fact, vacation would be I'll show perfect. you. Here's the picture. So yeah. uh, I think I can pull it up right here. If we go, I, yeah. I put it here in my documents folder. And uh, just to make it easy for the purposes of demonstration, I called it golf.jpg. So here's golf.jpg. This JPEG actually has my tomb key embedded oh, into man. it. You can That's look at this freaking file oh, yeah. and you'd have no idea there's no. a hidden key in there, right? No. I How love would it. you? I, mean, I love yeah. it. So 
Let's go. Uh, let's go <laughs> see if we cool. can mount this. So we'll do. Uh, so first, we have to pull out our key. So we. Uh, I have all this, by the way, uh, listed out in the show notes for you guys. So uh, if you want to learn how to bury the key or exhume the key, as they call it, it's all there. So you do tomb, exhume, dash K. You give it the path to where you want the key extracted to. Okay. Then you give it the path to the JPEG file the key is embedded in. So you can see here I'm saying exhume the key to my current directory mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and pull it from golf.jpg, which is located in my documents folder. So I execute that command. It asks me for the password. Right. Now, this actually is a very secure password. I give it that password. It now extracted the key. Now, if I look at my file system, oh, I now have the key. There is the... Uh, so it kind of gives it away. It's called... Because I called it disk2.vdi. Uh, now yeah. you know, right? So now now that we have that disk2.key.vdi uh, extracted, we can now mount my very secret special tomb. So we use now we just use our standard tomb mount command, which uh, is tomb open... Oops, open. You got to spell open right. Open. And then there's the, I'm saying open this win7disk2.vdi, which is actually my yeah. tomb file, with this key file. And then because I have my swap partition mounted, I'm saying go ahead and force. I hit enter. I enter my super secret key password, mm -hmm. which is uh, probably way too long for a demo. There we go. And now it mounts it, password OK, and boom, it just mounted it what appeared to be a VDI image, although I don't have, I don't have yeah, right yeah, access yeah. to it because I haven't found it yet. What appeared to be a VDI file is actually my secret tomb that I could stash full of files. And if, if anybody, and I'm thinking like maybe I'm crossing the border to Canada and right. the Mounties on their horses want to go over my bonobo, they would look at this and they would see a bunch of virtual disks and they would see a director full of JPEGs and they would never be the wiser that in one of those images is potentially thousands of confidential documents. You know, and it's an added pro tip. You could also have, make sure you, in your picture directory you have lots of selfies with Mounties on horses <laughs> because then you're just full of wind because they're going to be like, well, clearly he's one of us. I mean, clearly. Yeah, so now there's a couple of downsides. Chat room's always already pointed them out. By the way, yep. you could always keep that JPEG on the thumb drive just I was gonna to make say, it even you know, more. Uh, you know, what, if it was me, I would I treat it like the spare key syndrome. So it's like, you know, you have you have the one person that has the spare key for you, the, you know, like a physical key. Um, treat it the same way, I think, you know, to where you have multiple spare keys in multiple locations that are accessible if you forgot three of them, you know, where the fourth one is, that kind of thing. Yeah, you could, right? I would. Now, here's the areas of downside. Okay. I already mentioned one is you're using root a lot when you're doing yeah. this. So, not yeah. awesome. you got to have root access to a box. Probably already have that. The second thing I don't love about this process is while I'm doing it, there is key files being left around on my file system. So even though I can now go in here and remove that key file, right, and I still have I still have the uh, the JPEG I can go extract it from. While I'm working on it, there's mm -hmm. keys sitting around on my file system. That just seems like a window of risk that's too great. But it's from a practical standpoint, not insurmountable. It's not it's not, not like a really, deal breaker. Yeah. I mean, unless unless you are literally waiting for someone to kick your door in, I don't think it's a risk. I think that if yeah. you're just more concerned about privacy while traveling, um, especially with just some podunk that steals right. your laptop. Right. You know, that was you, my goal. But like, it, whatever, actually, you know. Slaver points out in the chat room, you could also maybe temporarily extract the key to a temp FS. Like that I was be, you get bad. to choose where you extract the key mm -hmm, to. So mm -hmm. you could extract it somewhere temporary, like a RAM disk or something like that. Not bad. Uh, idea. And uh, they also, um, Tomb has support for post-action scripts. Right. So right. you could also have a little bash file that Tomb calls that just goes and cleans things up immediately for you, okay. maybe with like a secure delete or something. Very interesting. So there is like, uh, oh, oh, and this oh. is also, there's other really neat features to Tomb. Like you can do uh, folder binding. So Ooh. you could have like your some of your dot .config folders actually live inside oh. Tombs. And when Tomb mounts those uh, volumes, right. it will bind the folders. So you could have some of your config files that are, it's essentially kind of like symlinks when they're called bound folders, mm -hmm. and you could have them live in your tomb, and then you could close the tomb and open the tomb, and uh, when you open the tomb, those applications would have access to their config, and when you close the tomb, those applications would look like they didn't have any configs, which also would be very good for plausible deniability. So, like, hypothetically, you have, like, you're, you're, you're like, secretly uh, a Justin Bieber guy, right? And your playlist is <laughs> living in this thing, and you do wow. not want anyone to know this stuff, because I don't. 
obviously am not into that, not even remotely. But you know, just as an example, you got <laughs> oh, some musical band. Right, that of you're course, really, sure, yeah. <laughs> some musical band you're really into. You can a secret. You can basically you're saying you could bind these uh, playlists and music files to that situation. To that tomb, yeah. Right, and then otherwise it's like, oh no, no. Rhythm he's, box. He's, me- he's a metalhead. You know? Yeah, you could because okay. you don't actually have to. What, what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is like, say yeah. you had a um, a playlist directory. You don't have to actually physically move that directory. You could just bind the location of that directory nice. inside the tomb. I like that. So yeah. again, you know, so then when you want to like put on your Justin Bieber wig and you know get your uh, get yourself all Biebered out, you know, and rock out. You I can, guess so. You can do that. Uh, personally, I wouldn't recommend it. At least not uh, unless you're in the privacy of your own home. <laughs> not for me. Uh, I guess another thing <laughs> I would like maybe this isn't necessarily a con, but a, a, an area I would love to see improvement. I actually started this on a quest to integrate my YubiKey. And I wanted to be able to have a passphrase and something I have. And if anybody out there has mm-hmm. found a way to use their YubiKey with Tomb, that would be awesome. And remember, yeah. I think I want to underscore what I like the most about Tomb is that it's just a set of really nice scripts that sit on top of a lot of just standard Linux technology. So really yeah, what Tomb right. is doing is Tomb is creating a loopback device, it's formatting that loopback device with extended four, it's encrypting that loopback device, and it's managing the keys for you, and then it's signing the loopback device and managing the mounting and unmounting for you. That's really what Tomb is doing. Right. But it, it essentially takes 15 steps and makes them two to three steps. You create, you dig the Tomb, you create the key, and then you lock the tomb. It's essentially like it. a three-step process. Seems like it's, you know, and the reason why it seemed more, and a couple of people commented on this, it seems more complex than it really is, is because we're showing you additional things yeah. you can do with it. Yeah, At the end of the day, it's stuff. three things. Yeah, it really is just three things, and you've you've replaced TrueCrypt with technology right. that's built into every Linux since kernel 2.6, which is like everything now. Which is versus the alternative, which may or may not be built into... You yeah, know, and the other thing is like... The closer you get to the quote-unquote Linux metal, the more eyeballs you have auditing the code, the more people that are improving it. The, like some of the stuff that we're working with is is industry-grade stuff because there's so many eyes on it and so many people are involved with the creation of it. And it's been around for years now. So it's like if you're going to move from something like TrueCrypt, you want to move to something that has at least the same amount of lifespan that TrueCrypt potentially had for you. Mm. And basing something on DM Crypt and Lux is a no-brainer because a really, at the end of the day with Tomb, all you're doing is making a loopback device. You can move that pretty much anywhere. So basically, this is taking the existing technologies and making it easy. Boom. Boom. There it is. Boom. Make Boom. it make it something standards-based that you can now make portable and mm-hmm. super mm-hmm. easy to get rolling. So it's Tomb. Links in the show notes, descriptions and guides, step-by-step instructions to get it installed. All of that's in there. Also, stag hide if you want to use the uh, built-in uh, steganography uh, capabilities, which I, I like recommend. That. That's cool. Yeah, that's all in the show notes so, as well. Ten thousand dollar question, and you know this is based on what I've been following so far. Uh, password. I'm, you know, I, I'm a dummy. Uh, it's like, yeah. oh crap, oh crap. What's my, my recommendation you know? for password would be go with a nonsensical sen- sentence. So something that's a whole sentence long, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's like duck staple battery sink purple, right? Make it. I make, make it, love to bacon. Well, that might actually be too close to actual English because it computer- might actually be too close to truth too. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I'm just saying there's always that possibility. I mean, you get a thing full of bacon, things happen. But you know, but something like involving uh, maybe some of your favorite, so something that's a little less uh, logical, something a little yeah. less flowy. Okay. Yeah. Something the computer would be like, what? That doesn't make any sense. And it's really easy. And it turns out it's been built into your Linux box all along. Interesting. We just helped you unlock the potential. So Matt, yes, that's the Linux action shows. Look at a real, legitimate, true crypt replacement. For Linux. Now that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. But Matt, yes. Before we get out of here, we got a couple of bits of feedback and follow up to get to. Our first one comes in from, um, <laughs> what? Do you, well, uh, we, me, we'll uh, just see, say Wiggle Waffles. Let's wh- just say wh- that. Wh- what are you right there? Wigra. Fallis. <laughs> right? Isn't that a great Okay. <laughs> it's pretty cool. But I, it was the message, Matt, that yeah, resonated. The message with me. matters. Sure. So Wiggle writes, uh, the last couple of weeks, the Linux desktop has really gotten me down. First, KDE refuses to work with Google Hangouts unless I have Pulse Audio installed. Then when I went to DO to install it, uh, or when I, went, uh, when I went to do an install, it makes audio extremely quiet until I plug it in and unplug my headphones from the headphone jack. No amount of adjusting KMX settings ever helps. Also, my Integros install properly launches KDE only about 50% of the time, so every time I want to use Linux, I have to reboot a number of times mm-hmm. for it to work in the first place. Okay. On my GNOME 3 computer, I recently installed some programs in Wine going full screen and then produces a buggy mess with the menu bar still appearing at the top. 
Uh, of course, this doesn't happen under KDE because I have KWIN, but under KDE, I have audio issues. So under GNOME 3, I have menu bar issues, but I don't have audio issues. Finally, I had an awful experience with Sync Thing this week. It failed to properly upload files, which I needed for my schoolwork, uh, and it happened multiple times. And one of the files was even corrupted in the write process, despite running the latest version of the software. I'm not trying to say Linux sucks. In fact, it does a number of amazing things, like running Windows software and virtual desktop for free. And things like advanced window management definitely aren't available on any closed platform. True. So I can't complain that much, but running into these problems in a quick succession has been a real bummer. Linux isn't disappointing because it doesn't do enough. It's because it aims higher than the competition and fails to meet those lofty goals. That doesn't make it any less disappointing sometimes, though. So a number of things happened here. Um, for one thing, when you come from a unified desktop experience like uh, OS X or Windows, usually you know if something fails, you have someone very specific you can shake your finger at and be like, update this or fix it or whatever it is. With Linux, you have desktop managers, file man, you know, mm -hmm. uh, file managers. You have all these different moving components that are happening. So By different it, people, different people. So for your for your needs, because this is the only part you're really going to care about. For your needs, it comes down to two simple things: uh, XFCE or Meiji. That, or Mate, if you will. Uh, those would be the two desktop environments I would recommend if you just want no nonsense. You just want it to work and you don't want any surprises. Stay away from all the other ones. That's just my opinion. Um, that'll get that'll keep you running. Um, second thing is uh, wine is a hack. It is not. It's I, people call it a tool. I call it a hack. You're using a hack to try and do something. So understand that as well. Um, I think those are the big components that you really want to look at. Is try to stick with a simple simple environment. It doesn't sound like you want a lot of additional moving parts mm -hmm. and to understand those things but linux is definitely more stuff that you got to kind of massage yourself through so you know something to consider you know something i picked up on is you mentioned schoolwork and i know that can right. be stressful that can make a person busy you, you don't you know, want K tolerance for yeah. problems is low yeah you you, so. you want a stable release you want a stable distro i don't care what it is but it, you not you know a uh, rolling release is fine as long as it's based on something stable you do not want to go with one of the arch derivatives i love arch but you're you don't have time for that Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know I, we say that all yeah, the time. I, I feel very... I, I run my, both, and I, I, know. I completely... Here's my take, and I, I'll add the caveat okay. that you okay. need to be Linux comfortable. Sure, sure, sure. But... And I'm not trying to brag, okay. but I literally... I literally have never met a person that is busier than me. I had on That's the minimum. Yeah. I on the minimum. I mean, just on a on on an easy day, mm -hmm. on a minimum, have two live shows a day, which means right. if you think about that, that's two unmovable deadlines every day some days yeah. it's three deadlines and that means hundreds of things have to happen in succession to meet those deadlines on a daily basis every mm -hmm. single day true mm -hmm. and i use arch so if somebody like me in in those constraints and i don't just use arch on one computer right no, i use you, arch you definitely on dedicated almost yeah. all of the computers right. so i mean i agree that yes it can have problems but i think if you but you're invested enough to, I mean... Well, you know, and I just, I, you know, I don't, I mean... If you're I, like, invested I, enough, I think it makes sense. I update at the right times, like there's a little right. bit of that too, yeah. but... Like, and I did, I, you know, I, I've had... I've had problems like with libx cursor right. where it still bites me. I did an yeah. update on Friday on the Bonobo. Oh, I, st I still got and, mine locked. <laughs> and for a half hour, I couldn't figure out why Steam right. wouldn't launch. Yep. And I was like, okay, Matt's... I was, this is what I was thinking. I was like, Matt's got me. Matt's right. Yep, I did an yep. update and I broke my Steam and I heard I can't yep. update. But you know what? It just turned out to be... The and it took me... You know what, though? It, yeah. it, it burned about 25 minutes to a half hour. Right. So it does happen. But you know what I did is I did that on a Friday evening when I knew I could. Mm. So I, That's okay. And that's I, fine. I will grant you, though, that if you are not in a position like I am to do that, or you're just uh, not emotionally invested in it, or yeah, then then Matt's mm -hmm. right. You know, you, you you should avoid the rolling distro. You really, but I I do I don't want to make it a general statement because I am somebody who's generally pretty risk adverse, but still manage somehow to make it work. Right. So I think it's possible. And the other thing is, I, I feel like rolling eventually. Everything will be rolling. Well, and I, I think eventually right. all distros will be rolling. And I do run two rolling distros. One, of course, is Arch based, you know, uh, and so that I've got that going for me, and that's my daily box. But the box that I can't yeah. afford to have broken is also rolling, but it's based on well, Debian. And then you can even go further and go <laughs> LTS, right? Yeah, exactly. So here's what I said so. to him. I actually responded in the subreddit. I said I found frustrated at when I get frustrated at times like this, like what he's getting frustrated right, by. Right. It's usually because I'm pretty busy and I'm under like other stressors that right. exasperate the problem. That's true. I, often what I found is that my core issue has been that I haven't mastered a single desktop environment. Mm. See, I, I also agree distro plays a big role. Sure. But I think even more than that, mastering one desktop environment matters because if you're busy, it means you need your computer to act 
like you expect it to act all the time. You need to do something, and it needs to do exactly what you expected it to do because you don't have time for it to do anything else. Makes sense. And if a problem arises, it needs to be second nature mm-hmm. for you to be able to resolve that quickly because you don't have time to waste it. So you need to have like reflex capabilities to resolve your problems. The best way to achieve that state is by using the same desktop over a long period of time so that you have time to encounter different types of problems, sure. resolve them, and then build a muscle-like reflex to troubleshooting those problems. That's excellent advice. Yeah, it's I, fun to jump around. Matt and I love to jump sure. around. In fact, I, I can't even stick to GNOME. Right? I have I have GNOME on like ninety percent <laughs> of the desktops, and then I have like a few extra other desktops out right, there. Right. Right. Uh, so what I did, you guys all know this, is I felt I was just going to sit down. I was going to eat my veggies, become a Jedi Master of GNOME, and I spent a month and I said. For one day, for 30 days, I will learn a known way of doing things. Okay. So that way, at the end of this month, I at least know what the key commands are, the way I'm supposed to be managing Windows in the virtual mm-hmm. desktop mm-hmm. spaces that are dynamic, all of this stuff. And at the end of that month, I said, okay, here's all the things I'm taking away from GNOME that I like. Here's right. all the things I'm going to adjust via extensions. Mm-hmm. And now, since I've done that, I've stayed in GNOME. And now I really am reaching that point where I sit down in the morning to do Tech Talk today, and I've got five minutes before we go on air, and it's early right. in the morning, my sound isn't working. It's a two-second resolution exactly, for me. Exactly, sure. Uh, so, th- there, now he says he spent most of his time on KDE, and that, you and, know... And uh, honestly, uh, you know, if you enjoy audio, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, you're going to be one of, you're going to fall into the camp where it always works, or you're going to fall into the camp where it always fails. There really isn't a lot of in-between from my experience. Uh, most of the chat room will say it always works. You, myself, Chris, will tell you we've had it fail a lot. So, you're going to fall into one of those two camps. So, like I said, when it comes to desktops, keep it simple. Yeah. Whatever you end up choosing, Word. make sure you're choosing for something simple that doesn't have a lot of moving parts, especially if you don't want to yeah. invest the time. And it doesn't you mean know. you can't jump to something later when you have more free time that's more fun to play with. Or but if you got more than one computer, hell, that's what I do. You know. And, you know, the thing is, is like, the thing about Windows, like Matt was kind of starting to get to, mm-hmm. is like, there's only been so many ways to do things there for yes. so long. There's a pretty well-established group of people that know how to work with it. And because Windows right. has been kind of boring for so long, yeah. even if you've only had slight exposure to it over the years, you've built up reflexes on how to use <laughs> Windows. Exactly. Just moving around a few times a year is enough that it creates indecisiveness in your brain, and it just takes an extra couple of milliseconds to decide where to go to click something. And when you eliminate that, you become so streamlined. In, and, and the thing is, is I, I feel like I'm getting a little bit on, a, on, a, on an advocacy box here, mm-hmm. but I, I honestly feel like if you're the type of person where I'm saying is making sense, GNOME is the type of desktop that once you get to that point, it's so obvious this is how a desktop should work that any other desktop on any other operating system really does not live up to the workflow that GNOME can provide if you're the type of person where everything I've just said makes sense to you. There's a lot of people, and that's perfectly fine, Rikai upstairs, the guy likes KDE, and he's also likes the Windows desktop, right? <laughs> right so right, it's, right. you know, they're from people, different stuff. Sure, sure. For me, I wanted to, I wanted a, a reflex like workflow GNOME right. provides, and I think it's great. Hey, works for me. But you know what? Aaron writes in totally different edge of the coin here, Matt. And he says, uh, "Hey guys, I think it'd be really interesting if you could take another look at PC BSD and compare it to GNU plus Linux. Right mm. now, it's at version 10, and it uses ZFS out of the box. Interesting. He's using Sabian, and he's thinking about switching to PC BSD. Well, won't uh, Alan be happy to hear I about that? I bet he will. Uh, you know what? We actually have a dedicated BSD show on the network called BSD Ooh. Now, and in episode 49." Uh, Chris Moore, the inventor of PCBSD, gave a tour. He's also the co-host with Alan Jude. Uh, gave a tour of PCBSD, and they're gonna, they liked it so much they're going to do a whole series of them coming up. And I am super jealous. <laughs> the guys are going to interview Ken Moore. Ken Moore is Chris Moore's brother. Chris right. Moore, the creator of PCBSD. Ken Moore, Chris Moore's brother, is creating a QT-based desktop that looks amazing. And I wouldn't normally say this about a really early right. desktop, but I've seen early. Um, I don't know if it was a screencast or what it was. It looked incredible. They're going to have Ken Moore on BSD now soon to talk about his new desktop, and they're going to continue to do tours of PCBSD over the next few episodes. So they just kicked it off with episode 49 of BSD now, and they'll have more. Well, and honestly, if you're thinking about PCBSD, you really should be subscribed to that. You should really be checking that out. Yeah, seriously. And uh, you know what? While we're talking about things you could add to your podcast queue, if you've wondered what happened to those crazy guys like Miguel E. DeCaza who made Mono, yeah. You ever wonder what happened wonder, to them? Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, just kind of like, van- it's like absorbed into the wall right. a little bit, right? Uh, Coda Radio episode 112, The Zamarian Solution. Mike talks about what they do now and how he's using some of the software they make 
to do app development. Interesting. So episode 112. And I, one last obnoxious plug. We did a bonus episode of Quarter Radio, two episodes uh, in the last week. Mm-hmm. Episode 113, episode lucky 113, Corner of Shame, uh, where uh, not only do I talk about the Oculus VR SDK uh, yeah. kit, my experiences with iOS 8, we do a review of Overcast FM, and we take some live calls in uh, 113. So two nice. really good Coda radios this week, too. So we got some good stuff for the queue. And then I Excellent. have a question before we run okay. for the audience. If you go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact or just leave us a note, probably even easier, in mm-hmm. the feedback thread over at linuxactionshow.reddit.com for this episode, have you ever tried out the Mozilla Sync own cloud plugin. Matt, look at no, this. No, I've not. I've heard of it and like in passing. So you know about Firefox yeah, Sync, course, right? Sure. This lets you use Firefox Sync across all your browsers as and your mm. own own cloud server as the back end infrastructure to host that sync. I like that. Yeah. I and like the control. I don't know though. Does it work? Does it work with own cloud seven? Is anybody out in our audience using yeah. this? Because I've got that new on Cloud uh, 7 box. Testing production. You know, we'd be interested in that as well. Yeah, yeah. I'd really like to know how that goes. So uh I Man, Boy. I'm excited about the possibilities with Definitely. OwnCloud. Hey, Matt, if I this. wanted to read a little bit of Matt Hartley throughout uh, the week, where They're they staggering and they're coming, but I'm still putting out articles. Uh, datamation.com, scroll down to open source. Otherwise, if you check the show notes, you'll find my linkage uh, directly to my articles right there. Mm, that's all good and well, Matt, but what if I hate reading and I prefer to watch things? We just wrapped up a video that will be posted by tomorrow afternoon. That's what that, she said. That's what she said. <laughs> and so it's in, it's, in produ- it's in editing right now, but um, there's going to be another Geek and the Gamer, uh, you just YouTube. Slash Geek and the Gamer. YouTube.com slash Geek and the Gamer. Tell you what, Matt. I've watched a few of those. They're really fun. Don't forget you can join us live on Sundays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. UTC over jblive.tv. Or just go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar Mm -hmm. where our robots will convert it into your local time zone. And if you show up live, not only do you get way more show, including pre-show and in-between segment stuff and post-show, but you can also join us for the faux show, which comes on right after the Linux Action Show. How about that for some Be show? Be here for that. Yeah. And uh, don't forget, we want your feedback. JupiterBroadcasting.com slash contact. Yes. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs> Search, oh, we know about open yeah, broadcast. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah for I sure. think we've... Uh, yeah. We've We've not really done a lot about it. Because yeah, we kind of uh, danced around it a little bit. But. And and unfortunately, this it, it falls into uh, open broadcaster falls into one of those things where like now that a thing exists, people are going to start saying, well, why aren't you using that thing? Oh my god! You know, because you know how that kind of like with production tools, like uh, not that we won't switch inappropriately early. Don't get me wrong, we will switch when it is painful, when it causes oh, production yeah. issues yeah. and costs time and money. Don't worry, we will switch before we should. But. Uh, you know, one of the things I've talked about with uh, media production under Linux is part of the problem about us getting just something like out the gate is even once uh, like Lightwork ships or whatever, like it's still so, so small as part of the overall picture and so far behind, like all of the other tools like Final Cut and Premiere and and, and Avid and Vegas, they, they didn't feature freeze five years ago, right? right? They're continuing to release new versions and add new features. So even once Open Broadcaster gets to like, you know, a stable point, right? It in theory has almost a decade of catch up. I mean, think about it. we've been using Wirecast now. For like what five years? Yeah, and that's not to say it isn't full of bugs and hassles. Right, it is. Well, that's the point, though. Yeah. Is even after five years of a company that charges a thousand dollars for that piece of software, iterating on it a couple of times a year with major releases, it still has problems. And Open Broadcaster is going to have that same process they have to go yeah. through to, uh, you know, have a lot of people using it and mature the product. And so, even once they reach a stable point, they still have years of catch up to do. So it's kind of like, it's a bittersweet thing. Like when I see the announcement open broadcaster, I'm like, okay, that's good. I think it makes a good tool for those starting out. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the, maybe that's the thing. It's like, but I also think, I think, you know, we have to just keep in mind that, um, and I, I, you know, I just watched a story in the subreddit. I just read a story last night in the subreddit about, um, uh, what did somebody try? Oh, SyncFS or Sync Thing. Oh, somebody yeah. tried Sync Thing and it, did, it broke on them, and yeah. they were in the middle of a school project, and they didn't get their files, and they lost like a couple of days worth of work. Yeah. And it's like, see so what what happens in the open source community is, as soon as we see an open source replacement for anything that there's a proprietary, pretty functional thing for, like BitTorrent Sync or Dropbox, 
we all just sort of get in this collective echo chamber about, oh, I better switch because that's the open. I better start right. using sync thing, mm -hmm. even though BitTorrent sync is viable and it's been in production longer, or Dropbox is viable in production longer. You know, privacy issues aside. Uh, we just kind of get this collective, collective group think that, oh, we have to switch because the open source version is here now, so we must hate freedom unless we switch now. And what happens is, is a lot of times as a community, we pressure ourselves to switch to something long before it's ready. True. So you do things like use ButterFS and now you lose out on about 20 gigabytes of space on your drive. <laughs> or you switch to sync thing and you lose out on three days of work. Or you switch to open broadcaster and your production's out for a day because the system's not ready. But as a group, we constantly are pushing and pressuring each other Hey, how come you're not using sync thing? Hey, how come you're not using HTML5? Hey, how come you're not using open broadcaster? Hey, how come you're not using mumble? But the reality is those tools are not good enough even though they're open source. So what we have to do is be able to find a balance between the group think mentality and the practical use of these things. And what we need to do is have some people use them early like sync thing to get the bugs worked out over time in open broadcaster. Definitely. But then we also have to recognize that there's a separate group of people that it is actually not appropriate for them to switch before something is ready. And those people are not wrong. Those people don't hate freedom. They just have a different set of realities and constraints that they have to work within. And I think what we need to do as a community is be a little more understanding about that because those people aren't necessarily a lost cause. It just means we need to get our stuff better. And that's not something that we can't, it's not, we can do that. That's like the open source community is good yeah. at iterating, 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 iterating. That's our bag. So that's not a big problem. That's not something that we should feel challenged about and have to lash out at people for. That's something that we should understand and be like, okay, well, you know, I'd love to hear your feedback about what X is missing right. to make right. it get to here. So that way we can build it to that point. And I think if more of the community took that approach, people wouldn't necessarily feel kind of like that that om almost peer yeah. pressure to got to use the free thing a lot of a lot of linux people from my experience because i've seen this happen i had a guy recently or a couple, couple people actually emailed me about their problems trying to get zone minder set up and mm. i've worked with them and came to a conclusion for what they're looking for and the level of expertise they present and the ver various challenges they're presented with it wasn't a match for them and actually suggested a closed source alternative on another operating system for their needs I got a lot of crap from that by another person that found out about it. I was like, well, that's not... <laughs> and I'm like, but at the end of the day, it works for me because I'm willing and able to drill down on all the challenges with it. But a lot of people are using technologies and tools and whatnot, or just time even, that it may not be a match for them. And I think that's the tool. So if someone's first starting out, they want to try out the open source stuff. Hey, that's awesome. That's great, right? Rule Talk about making the entry to barrier super low. Absolutely. But when it comes to anything mission critical, never, ever, ever, ever trust anything i don't care what the license is that's fresh on fresh on the scene i don't give a rat's right yeah but and that's true is. for commercial software uh, exactly. i mean probably even more so Free, because there's especially less people... freeware freeware is horrible certain open source op applications can be iffy test them test them test them don't ever especially when it comes to file storage i'm sorry yeah. sync thing i it's adorable it's, and it's, no. it's definitely not unique to open source it is in fact i think in some cases worse with proprietary software oh, i yeah. think for example like if wirecast was open source i think a lot of the shortcomings of Wirecast would have been publicly exposed long before, oh, yeah. you know, like you know what I mean, like definitely. And and I think the mar like the marriage of having the the Wirecast money behind it with an open source license that would be that so would be sweet. the ideal marriage yeah. that you got the funds and to address. I'll, I'll tell you, you what, the, man. You know, if Open Broadcaster got to like seventy percent, maybe eighty percent of the Wirecast functionality, yeah, I would totally, totally, totally be willing to pay good money for that, especially oh, sure. something. I would rather see. Here's the thing about the way I look at it is I would, I would rather pay a lot, lot more for open source, and yes. still have it be a business product because if it's if my business is dependent, like if this was a manufacturing plant and that's the critical part of the manufacturing, uh, you know, conveyor belt. Like I want to know what that I want to know the future of that technology. I want to know the roadmap of that technology. Mm -hmm. I want to know the ins and outs of that technology, and that's something open source can provide you. And I still think it's perfectly fine to pay for open source and and buy a support contract and all of that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and even if they I would even if they even if they didn't ship me the code, if I could just go download it when I wanted to check it, or if I wanted to hire a contractor to review it, or right. if they decided to discontinue the project, I could hire a, a third party uh, developer to keep it running for a couple of years while I found something else to move to. Exactly. So that to me makes open source more valuable. It's worth more money that way. Because here the, at the end of the day, it's like okay, some new product comes comes on the market. And and maybe it's proprietary, maybe it's open source, and we're like, oh, hey, cool, we can drop, uh, we can drop what we're using. Um, let's just go ahead and export all our stuff. Oh, that's right, proprietary lock-in. 
So we're you know we're locked in as it is. But if it was an open source product and we're paying for a service contract and that was possible, yeah. and still had the same level of functionality, yeah. then we could That's potentially great. bring a contractor That's in awesome, to move right? us to another. I mean that'd piece. be win-win. Exactly. Proprietary locking is definitely a, that's a legitimate concern, whereas, well, it's not open source, to me, isn't. Right. Uh, proprietary locking, yeah, that, that's a headache. I, I'm with you on that one. Yeah, but yeah. That I totally get. Proprietary software is not ethical.